And once again, I start a chapter with a non so quitter about something passing something else. But I'm out of fresh ideas. So in this chapter, I'm simply not going to say it. I'm going to mumble it like this. <laughs> when Adonizedek, king of Jerusalem, whose name apparently means my lord is righteous, but apparently his lord is not righteous enough for the lord to be mad enough to send Joshua to commit genocide against him. Well, anyway, when Adonai Nazedek, king of Jerusalem, had heard how Joshua had taken Ai, Ai, and had utterly destroyed it, and had wondered how easy a task it must have been for Joshua, since, as I have noted before, the name Ai, Ai, means a heap of ruins, as Joshua had done to Jericho and her king, so had he done to Ai, Ai, and her king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel by selling themselves into perpetual slavery instead of suffering an act of genocide and were among them hewing wood and drawing water for the altar of the Lord, which they were not permitted to approach. And no, this is also not a run-on sentence. And they feared greatly an understandable reaction to the horror of repeated acts of mass murder, genocide, ethnic cleansing, and slavery, because Gibeon was a great city as one of the royal cities, because it was greater than Ai. Ai! which means that it's a tad bit better than a heap of ruins, and all the men thereof were mighty, which begs the question of why they sold themselves into slavery instead of fighting against Joshua. Apparently they weren't all that mighty. Wherefore, Adonai Natzedek, king of Jerusalem, said to Hoham, king of Hebron, whose name means whom Yahweh impels, and unto Piram, king of Jarmuth, whose name means like a wild ass, and to Jephia, king of Lachis, whose name means shining, and to Debir, king of Eglon, whose name means sanctuary. And no, I did not make those up. Those are the actual Hebrew translations of those names. Anyway, Adonai Natsedek sent to Pote by Yahweh, the wild ass shining, and sanctuary, saying, Come up unto me and help me, that we may smite Gibeon, for it hath made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel, but the adults of Israel wanted nothing to do with it. Therefore, the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, who supplied the infantrymen, the king of Hebron, who supplied the ammunition and fuel, the king of Jarmuth, who sent in two tank battalions, and the king of Lachis, who sent in air support, and the king of Eglon, who sent in the cooks and the mechanics that pretty much tried to stay out of the fight. These kings gathered themselves together and went up and all their hosts and SUN for multilateral support in order to stop a terrorist group that was in the process of committing genocide. But the UN did turn them down and told them that Israel was allowed to do such thing even though anybody else committing the same exact crimes against humanity would violate international treaties. So they encamped before Gibeon and made war against it. And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp of Gilgal, with an email message and a Facebook post and a YouTube video response saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants, for we, according to the previous chapter, we have all chosen to become the slaves of the Israelites. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us, for all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. And though we are all mighty men here in Gibeon, even greater than the heap of ruins at Ai, Ai, we just don't want to have anything to do with these mountain boys. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor, to go and save the men of Gibeon, who were also mighty men of valor. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them unto thine hand, as there is no way that thou shalt have any chance of winning this battle unless thou hast miraculous intervention. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. And Joshua answered and said unto the Lord, isn't that what you said before I fought against Ai? Ai! When about thirty and six soldiers were killed in action? And the Lord said, That was because they committed the unpardonable crime of looting the city before being given permission to loot the city in the very next chapter, which happened after they committed an act of mass murder of twelve thousand innocent people, which is apparently quite acceptable. And Joshua said, No, of course, 
That makes perfect sense. No, wait, no, it doesn't. And Joshua shrugged his orders and came suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night. As we all know, it takes all night to take action suddenly. And the Lord discomfited them before Israel, meaning that God moved noisily to confuse or vex. And this is exactly the same thing the Lord shall do to Sisera in literally Judges chapter 4. But let me finish this series first. And the Lord slew them, them being the Amorites, not the Israelites, though one is not entirely certain reading this verse, with a great slaughter at Gibeon, and chased them along the way that goeth up to Beth Haran, and smote them in Azekah unto Makeda. And the people of Israel stared and wondered and ate popcorn while they watched God, an old man in white robes, crackly beard, and carrying a large wooden club in his hand, screamed at the top of his lungs and chased around the Amorites. And the mass as they fled before Israel running down the side of the hill while trying to get away from the Lord, and they were going down to Beth Horon, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them to Asaka, for behold, the Lord was in two places at once. And they died. In fact, if this three thousand year old book of stupid is to be believed, there were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. This actually appears to be true, for if this verse is to be taken literally, exactly as written, that the children of Israel did bugger all to fight in this battle, neither with the sword, nor with the dagger, nor with a katana, nor with a scimitar, nor even with a bare bodkin. Perhaps the adults of Israel did something not written in this verse. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, but of course this book of stupid specifieth not what Joshua said unto the Lord, but I shall summarize that he said something like this. Watch this, this will be great. And he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still upon Gibeon and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the turtle, carrying the sun across the top of the crystallized dome, covering the area of the earth's surface known as the Middle East, heard Joshua's voice, and hearkened to him and stopped walking across the dome. And the sun stood still, the moon stayed, as the snail that carried the moon also stopped, until the people have avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? Well, let me check. Literally Genesis, literally Exodus, literally Joshua, books of history read by Bonnet Dance, Gospels with commentary by Prophet D.H. Nope, I don't see the book of Jasher. Well, there's only one thing to do in situations like this. Make a noun into a verb and Google it. Well, according to Google, there is in fact a book of Jasher, and it appears to be a little more than certain books of the Bible, mostly the Torah and Joshua, written in King James English. This verse is found in Joshua chapter 8, verses 63 and 64, which saith, And when they were smiting, the day was declining toward the evening, and Joshua said in the sight of all the people, Son! Stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon, in the valley of Echelon, until the nation shall have revenged itself upon its enemies. And the Lord hearkened unto the voice of Joshua, and the sun stood still in the midst of the heavens, and it stood still six and thirty moments. And the moon also stood still, and hastened not to go down a whole day. Of course the Bible saith, So the sun stood in the midst of the heaven, and hastened not to go down about a whole day, so which is to be believed? The book of Jasher, an ancient book of stupid, appears to directly contradict the Bible, another ancient book of stupid. Now, there shall not be a literally Jasher series, and I cannot discern a group of religious bigots murdering innocent people because they believe not the book of Jasher. Neither do I see a group of woefully ignorant public officials forcing school children to read Jasher. For after all, it happened to be the best source of science and history that our schools may be provided. Therefore, it is that other book of stupid, the Bible, which is to be pwned. So then, I shall spend the rest of this video pwning this verse and save the remnant of this chapter for the second part of this video. So, let's ascertain a proper geological and cosmological understanding of the relationship between the earth and the sun. Forget the turtle, and forget the snail. In fact, I'll also forget the crystallized dome covering a portion of the earth's surface. That's an idea unique to this 3,000-year-old book of stupid, and it doesn't comport to a proper understanding of science. The 24-hour periods of time consistent of day and night are not caused by the sun rotating in orbit around the Earth, for the Earth is not the center of the sun's orbit. 
the large bright bundle of stars in the middle of the galaxy is the center of the sun's orbital rotation, just like the orbital rotations of the billions of other stars in the galaxy. Our planet, just like the seven other planets in our solar system, sorry Pluto, orbits around the sun as the other estimated hundreds of millions of exoplanets orbit around their respective stars. The approximately 365 days it takes for the Earth to orbit around the Sun in relation to the other solar objects and the cosmos is what defines our Earth year. The day and night as observed on planet Earth is derived from the rotation of the Earth about its axis in relation to the Sun. Daytime is caused when the light from the Sun hits our side of the planet and nighttime is caused when the sunlight hits the far side of the planet. The light of the Moon is a mere reflection of the light of the Sun and what part of the Moon is reflected to the Earth depends on the relative positions of the Sun, the Earth, and the Moon. This is elementary science, and it surprises me that the religious tars don't know such things, but then I remember who I'm talking to. Further, I'm even willing to admit that some of the terms I've used in this ponage attempt are technically incorrect, and I'm so hoping that my science education counterparts would forgive me for such a travesty. After all, I'm a history major, not a science major. Now, if the Bible true, and we all know that it isn't, then to say that the sun stood still in the sky for 24 hours, it is not because the sun stops orbiting around the earth, because the sun doesn't orbit around the earth to begin with. It is the earth that would have to stop rotating about its axis, or to sync its actual rotation to that of the sun's own actual rotation, much like the moon's rotation is synced to that of the earth's, which is why we always see the same face of the moon. Really, whichever scenario would have happened would not matter, as this apparently only happened for 24 hours, which is approximately 1 365th of the total orbit of the Earth around the Sun. Now, if the Earth suddenly stopped its actual rotation, this would cause all of the tectonic plates on Earth to smash into one another, and further cause massive earthquakes at every single geological fault line all over the surface of the Earth. Every volcano on Earth would erupt. There would be tsunamis on every shoreline on Earth. The damage caused to the Earth's surface would be massive, undeniable, and we would still be recovering from it. Every society upon the face of the Earth would record such a massive, large-scale, global geological event, and each of the records would all occur at the exact same time, or at least in the same point in their history. All recorded the same types of extreme geological and meteorological events, including the fact that the sun did not rise or set for an entire day. In fact, let's let our friend Wildwood Clare 1 Describe the scenario. I may sum up. You're suggesting that this cataclysmic, unprecedented event swept across the planet, moved billions and billions of tons of continental crust, thousands of kilometers, totally reordered our whole planet, obliterated pre noachian society. There's no hint of a village, nothing in the fossil record to indicate these people ever existed. Okay, let's be fair. Claire was talking about the ridiculous myth of Noah's Flood. I can't find a Ponage video about Joshua stopping the sun in the sky. Nobody ever likes to talk about Joshua. Mostly because even the religious tars know how ridiculous this 3,000 year old book of stupid actually is. And yet this tiny boat, constructed with, at most, Bronze Age technology, bobbed peacefully on the waves and survived it. Uh, but of course, given all this massive damage caused by the greatest seismic activity that has ever occurred at every fault line over the face of the planet, and the accompanying excessive tsunami and flood damage at every shoreline, we have an even greater problem to consider. There is a certain geological feature that would be affected by the sudden loss of the rotation of the Earth about its axis. Uh, what would that geological feature be? Unfortunately, I'm not a science major, so I wouldn't have the foggiest idea what it might be. Perhaps I ought to ask some of these prominent scientists. Eric, do you have any ideas? Oh, I see. You're merely parroting your father currently in prison for fraud. Nephi, how about you? Do you have something to say? No, of course not. You're still reeling from the fact that while we were clear, one and Paul C. Hartley pwned you most severely for your ridiculous comments regarding Noah's flood. <laughs> Banana Man, do you have an answer? Crocoduck Boy? No? 
So, you mean to tell me that the most prominent scientific minds of our generation don't possess the globular clusters of self-replicating molecules large enough to defend your own religiously inspired superstitions, or at least to offer a suitable scientific explanation for your 3,000-year-old book of stupid? <sighs> well, it looks like I'm going to have to pull out the big guns. Tell me, Mr. Scientist, what major geological feature would be missing if we experienced a sudden loss of planetary momentum? Gravity, you f***ing tard! Gravity! Have you ever heard of f***ing gravity? Gravity! Gravity! Now let us assume just for lulls that the same geological or cosmological event that halted the rotation of the Earth also halted the gravitational pull of the Earth. Now geological scientists are still at each other's throats about what precisely causes gravity. But it is a reasonable assumption that any scenario which causes the disruption of normal momentum of a planetary object in relation to nearby objects in the cosmos will also completely halt its inherent gravitational force. If this is even remotely the case, as every person on Earth would already be dealing with massive injuries and deaths, as well as excessive earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, fire, and flood damage, now they have to deal with the loss of gravity, causing themselves, their homes, their property, and everything that isn't nailed down to the ground, including both the nails and possibly even the ground, to suddenly shuffle off this mortal coal and float off into outer space. Something tells me that the Israelites had a whole lot more problem on their hands than just a little Bronze Age battle with five armies of Amorites. Well, enough ponish for now. I'm tired of looking at this ridiculous chapter, so I'll just finish part one of this video. So the sun still is still in the midst of heaven and haste not to go down about a whole day. So in other words, everything that I just said about the halting of planetary momentum has to be repeated, including earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and tsunamis, along with the sudden return of that other geological feature. What was it again? Gravity! Oh yes, that's right. Gravity! Alright, I heard you the first time. Gravity! Ow, my ears are bleeding. And there was no day like that before nor after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man and caused global catastrophes the like of which the world has never seen, practically destroying the whole earth with a major geological, meteorological, and cosmological phenomenon so significant that it makes Noah's Ark look like a slight drizzle, a, a rainfall so light that it is actually a waste of time to try to find one's umbrella, so one simply runs from one's camel into one's tent to wait a few minutes until the rain stops. Funny, isn't it, that no other society on the face of the planet chose to record such a major worldwide catastrophe. All of this was done so that the Israelites would receive an ever so slight advantage over their enemies on the battlefield, for the Lord fought for Israel. And Joshua returned and all Israel with them into the camp of Gilgal to try to rebuild their homes after this global disaster absolutely obliterated their homes, killed their families, ravaged their livestock and farmlands, and left them completely destitute. Perhaps they should have left the bloody Amorites alone. Up to the walls of Jericho, smart on in and hang. Go blow them a hard cut, guys, you way. The battle is in my head. Hallelujah! Gravity! Gravity! <sighs> now I need a cigarette.